give it up for Austin Wesley! I love it. Can you, I don't even need to preach. You all can just play the whole day. Would that be good if, if they just played the whole time? Uh, one more song. Man. Well, it is such an honor to be here today. It really is. And I'm just, uh, I'm just so impressed by what God is doing here and by what God did last night. God's amazing. And the fact that we get to be a part of this is just, is just nuts. It's crazy that we get to be in this moment together. And I believe God's got a lot more that he wants to do. Well, hey, you can say hi to three friends and then have a seat all across this place. Well, it truly is an honor to be with you. It's an honor to be here at James River Youth. And I don't come alone. I do come with my amazing wife, Lauren. She's sitting right over there. And I believe we got a picture of my family we can put up, my, my wife and I. Uh, we are just, uh, we're excited to be doing what we get to be doing. That's my son, Jude. He just turned three. And as Pastor Clint said, we are the district youth directors for the Southern Missouri District of the Assemblies of God. And we're just uh, honored that we get to be a part of building the local church. And we get to do it as a family. And our son Jude, he is adorable. I think he's the cutest kid in the world. But do not let his looks fool you. That boy desperately needs Jesus, okay? He needs the Lord to do a work in his heart, something fierce, because uh, he is out of control, okay? He's, he's adorable, but he will destroy your house, your neighborhood, your city in like three minutes. I kid you not. But we are honored that we get to, uh, to do all of this together. And we're actually honored to call James River Church our, our home church. When we are in town, uh, this is the church that we get to be a part of. This is the house that, that we get to come to. And I love this church for many reasons. But one of the reasons that I love it so much is because you have some amazing leadership at this church. Pastor John and Debbie Lindell, who are the lead pastors of this church. Some of you may not be familiar. Most of you are. But Pastor John and Debbie Lindell, they are legacy leaders. And they are going to leave a legacy through their leadership. And something to understand about legacy is that before a legacy can be left, it has to first be lived. And your pastors are living a legacy right before our eyes. And not just them, but also the staff that they have put in place to oversee the different ministries of this church. I love the leadership of this church and of this youth ministry. Can we please make some noise and honor the leadership of this house, honor your youth pastors, Pastors and your youth leaders, come on, you can stand to your feet. The whole team, Pastor Clinton Cammy, Pastor Kendall, Pastor Juan, Pastor Darren, Pastor Tucker, come on. You've got some amazing leaders. And students, listen, they are even more impressive off the stage than they are on the stage because they're living a legacy and we get to be a part of it. So honored. Well, hey, if you got a Bible, we're going to jump right in today. I don't want to waste any time. We're going to be in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 22. Genesis, that's the first book of the Bible, if you didn't know. Now you know. Genesis chapter 22. Comes right after Genesis chapter 21. I promise it's in there. Old Testament. And as you're turning there, as we're getting ready to read the Word, I do have a question that I want to ask you. Uh, how many of you, by a show of hands, would say that you are adventurous. Oh, this is good. Adventurous crowd. Okay, great. How many of you would say you, you like to take some risks? Come on, be proud of it. I'm talking like you, you'll take risks with like extreme sports. Uh, you'll take risks that don't even make sense, like dumb stuff that you shouldn't do. You'll, you'll, you'll jump off something and try something like you like to take risks. How about with food? Anyone willing to take some risks with food? Like you'll eat anything in front of you, like if it's edible. I wouldn't consider myself a, uh, a very adventurous person. I don't take a lot of risks. However, a while back, I did have the opportunity to do something adventurous. I was visiting a friend of mine. He, he lives on the coast in Florida. 
And my friend said to me, he said, hey, bro, did you hear? I said, what? He said, I bought a plane. I said, I'm sorry? He said, yeah, I bought a plane. I said, like, like an airplane? He said, yeah, I bought one. Who just buys a plane? I'm like, this is, this is already weird. Who, you have a plane? He said, yeah, do you, you want to take a ride in my plane? I said, is it safe? He said, of course it's safe. I'm flying the plane. Of course it is safe. I'm like, bro, that's a reason for me to believe it wouldn't be safe, okay? But I said, sure, I'll try this. We'll go. We'll see what happens. And so we go to this airport. We drive through security, which is basically a fence. We drive to this airport, pull up, and the airport is basically just a parking lot with planes in it. Just a parking lot. Like, the longer this goes on, the more I'm thinking to myself, why did I do this? I'm fully expecting when we pull up to these planes to pull up to like a, like a DJ Khaled, like private jet, or like a Taylor Swift private jet, or Justin Bieber jet. Like, that's what I'm expecting, fully. That's what I'm expecting to see. But when we drove through the parking lot full of planes, and we pulled up to his plane, uh, this is the plane that we were about to get in. We have a picture of it, I believe. It should be up there. That's the plane. <laughs> he expected me to get in that with him and let him fly. I want you just to notice how short the plane is. Like, it's shorter than me. That plane is miniature. That is not a private jet. And if you look through the window, you can see the door on the other side. Well, the door was so small that it was actually above the wing on the side of the plane. It was smaller than my car door. In order to get into this plane, you had to crawl up onto the wing and crawl into the plane. I'm getting ready to get in the plane. I'm thinking, I don't know if I should do this, but I'm here. I made the commitment. So we get in the plane. We're strapping in. We're putting on our headsets. I turned to my friend. I said, hey, do you, do you have like a helmet or something that we put on here? Like, like, do we get helmets or anything? He said, bro, why would you need a helmet? Well, in, in case we crash. He said, if we crash in this thing, a helmet is not going to do you any good whatsoever. He said, trust me, you, you're not going to need a helmet if we crash. Rest assured. I'm like, great. This is awesome. And so he turns on the plane, and we're beginning to taxi towards the runway. And as we're taxiing towards the runway, he says, bro, this plane, it's a classic. I said, what, what do you mean a classic? He said, it's a classic. It's like 60 years old. Why would I ever want to get in a plane that is 60 years old? Like, why is that a good thing? He said, yeah, it's a classic. It's like 60 years old. Been around for a long time. Long time. Don't make them like this anymore. We're getting closer to the runway, and all of a sudden, he starts doing this. And he starts tapping one of the gauges on the front of the plane. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I got I to gotta adjust this gauge sometimes. Sometimes you just got to tap it. So why? He said, well, all of the gauges have to be in the green, and if all of the gauges are not in the green, then we can't take the plane up today. So I had to knock it a few times to make sure it got up in the green. At this point, I pulled my phone out. You can ask my wife. I start sending her text messages. Girl, I love you. Tell Jude that I love him. Make sure that he gets all of my stuff. I want all of my inheritance to go to him. This could be the last time I ever talk to you. I love you. Tell my family. Like, I'm, I'm getting scared. I'm terrified at this point. But we're this far into it, we're hitting the runway, and so here we go. And we take off, we take off into the wind, get up in the air, all of a sudden the city below us is getting smaller and smaller, and before we know it, we're at about six, 7,000 feet in the air. And eventually we break through this line of clouds, and we're actually over the ocean, and you can still see the ocean, and it's absolutely beautiful. It's amazing about 7,000 feet in the air, and he says, through the microphone, he goes, uh, hey man, you wanna fly the plane? Uh, are you serious? Yeah, bro, I'll let you fly the plane. If you wanna fly it, take the yoke. So he hands me the yoke, which is a, a fancy word for steering wheel, and I begin to fly the plane at almost 8,000 feet in the air. I've never even flown a flight simulator before. I'm not even good at video games, bro. Like, there is no reason why I should be flying a plane at 8,000 feet in the air, 
but here I am flying an actual plane over the ocean. I flew it for a few minutes, and it didn't last long before I started to panic. I felt like my chest was like constricting. My breathing became kind of strange. I felt like a panic attack was coming on. I'd never even had one, but it felt like one was setting in, and I kind of freaked out. I said, I can't do this anymore. You got to take it. And I handed it off to him, and he took it, and he said, what's the matter? Are you, are you okay? Are you good? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm taking deep breaths. I'm, like, I'm just trying to calm myself down. I said, yeah, I'm good. I said, I just felt like, I felt like I was taking us down really fast. I said, I felt like I was making the plane dive. I didn't like that feeling. I felt like I was ruining the moment and could have killed us. Like, I was actually scared. I said, I didn't like it. It was weird. He said, bro, look at the gauges. He said, look at these instruments. You weren't going down. In fact, you weren't losing altitude at all. The entire time you were flying, you were actually gaining altitude. He said, what happens is that the higher you fly, the more of the horizon you can see. And the more of the horizon you can see, the more disoriented you become. And before you know it, up looks like down and down looks like up. But it's an optical illusion. It's not what it looks like. Students, I want to preach a message to you this morning, and the title of the message is this. It's not what it looks like. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that at the top of your paper or put that in your phone. It's not what it looks like. The reason I want to preach this message to you this morning is because I believe that if you've been following Jesus for a day or you've been following Jesus your whole life, at some point on this journey of following Jesus, you will come to a place where your surroundings will convince you that you are losing the things that you are actually gaining. And the enemy wants you to buy into everything that you're seeing because he wants you to believe that you are losing the anointing, that you are losing the blessing, that you're losing the favor, and that you're losing ground. But students, it might not be that you're losing ground. It might be that you are gaining ground. But as you're gaining ground, you go through a developing season where God is developing some things within you so that you can sustain that which he wants to put on you, but it's not what he looks like. All that we see is not all that there is. God is constantly doing more. Some of you need to be reminded that God is up to something. God is up to something, even if you can't see it. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. If you're there, say, I am there. If your neighbor didn't bring a Bible, point them out right now. Come on, put them on blast. Genesis Chapter 22, verse 1, it says this. Sometime later, somebody say later on. on. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. That's fun. He said to Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. "Uh, The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son, and the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He found his son Isaac, excuse me, he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. 
Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now you can praise God for that. This passage of of scripture has bothered me in some senses for most of my life. I grew up in church. I'm a pastor's son, pastor's grandson. I've been around the word of God and around church my whole life. And I've heard this story many, many times. And for years, it, 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 it bothered me a little bit. Because I would read this passage and I would think to myself, how is this God? How is this the instruction of God? How could this be the loving God that I know? How could this be the graceful God that I know? How could this be the kind, gentle God that I know that would ask someone to sacrifice their son? And for years, it seemed as if this passage contradicted the love of God. But students, the more I have studied this passage, I have found out that it does not contradict the love of God. It actually confirms the love of God. You see, in their day, it would have been very normal for a false god with false teachings to demand that a human sacrifice be made at the drop of a hat or any moment that they asked someone to. So the fact that Abraham's God, the one true God, our God, the God who would become the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fact that he had him go all the way to the place of sacrifice but allowed him to withhold his son, what that says is our God values life. He values the life of the old. He values the life of the middle age. He values the life of the young. And he values the life of the unborn. Our God values life. He always has and he always will. It confirmed the love of God. It didn't contradict it. And it began by God showing up and having this moment with Abraham. Abraham was a man who had settled in a place called Beersheba. And God showed up, and we see three of the most intimidating words in Scripture. It's these three words. God tested Abraham. God tested Abraham. Why why is that a little bit intimidating? Here's why. Because if God tested Abraham, he can test me. And if God tests me, he can test you. He can test us. And I don't know about you, but I don't like tests. Is there anyone in the room who actually likes tests? Raise your hand. Keep it up high. Be proud. If you like tests, keep it up real high, real high. Okay, after this service, we're going to have a special prayer service just for you because you need Jesus. Pastor Clint's going to lead you. He's going to have anointing oil, the whole thing. I'm kidding. That's weird. I'm not going to do that. I don't like tests. I like what tests get me. I like where tests can take me. I like the trust that comes on the other side of a test, but I don't necessarily like tests. And you may have heard it preached A faith that has not been tested can't be trusted. I think that's true, but I think that's not the whole story. Because I think the way it should be said is a faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted with more. You see, any time God tests us, it is an indicator that he already trusts us. The thing about our God is that he's a good shepherd, he's a good father, but he's also a good teacher. And a good teacher never gives a test on material that has not already been taught. So anytime God tests you, he's already trusting you with what he has spoken to you, with what he has shown you, with what he's put inside of you, and with what he has done around you. So if you're in the room and you're feeling like you're walking through a testing season, please get some confidence about your walk and some swagger in your step, because the fact that God is testing you, it means he's trusting you today. He's trusting what he's already shown you. There's a level of trust that has to come when a test is given. And I love the tests of God because they're different than the tests of Satan. They're different than the tests of man. See, the tests of Satan, they are always given through temptation. The tests of Satan are always tied to temptation. The tests of God are always tied to instruction. 
The tests of God are also different than the tests of man because the tests of man are given to gauge us, but the tests of God are given to grow us. See, when God tests us, he's not in it for examination. He is in it for expansion. He already knows where we're at. He's trying to prepare us for where he's calling us to go. So if God has put it in front of you, you can trust it can soon be behind you if you step into the test. Man, I just believe God's looking for a group of students who would step into the test, who would step into the test, who would step into the test. Somebody say, step into it. Abraham was about to step into the test. And so God told him exactly what he expected him to do. He said, Abraham, take your son, your only son, the son that was supposed to be the son of the promise. See, Abraham was promised to be the father of many nations. And Isaac was the one that the promise was going to come through. And he said, take your only son Isaac to the region of Moriah on a mountain that I will tell you about, that I will show you, that I will reveal to you. That is so like God. Because when God has us do something, he will usually give us a direction long before he reveals a destination. See, oftentimes with God, we are going to have to start before we ever know where we're going to stop. I'll never forget being a freshman in high school. Any freshmen in here? Come on, freshmen. So freshman in high school. I was playing on the basketball team. It was the first day of basketball practice. Whole team showed up. We had brand new matching shoes on. They were clean. No scuffs on them in Jesus' name like they're supposed to be. Clean shoes. Showed up for practice. Coach says, okay, everybody go outside. I said, why are we going outside? He said, because we're going to run. I said, coach, can't we run inside? He said, yeah, but you can run a whole lot farther outside. Run so much further. So we go outside. He tells us to stand in the street. So we go stand in the street. He has us face north. He gets his whistle out. He blows his whistle, and he says, go. And everyone just starts running. As we're running, all of the freshmen are thinking, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. We have no idea where we're going. We got these brand new shoes on. We're going to get clowned the first time we show up to a game and our shoes have grass stains and rock nicks on them. This is ridiculous. What's happening? We didn't know we were going to have to run all the way down past the post office a few blocks, turn right, run all the way down to a railroad, head over the railroad on this bridge four times and back, and then run back past the post office all the way back to the school. We had no idea how far we were going to have to run and when we would get to stop. But when we started, we didn't know when we would need to stop because there were other people there who knew where we were going and they were going to lead us and give us instruction as we needed it. It was the captain of the team. He knew exactly where we were running and we didn't need to know where we were going to stop when we started. Students, on this journey with Jesus, you're not going to know where you're supposed to stop every time God gives you an instruction. You've just got to start. You've got to take the first step. You've got to get going. You've got to get moving. You say, okay, well, what does that mean for me? What does that look like for my life? Here's what it looks like for most of us. Involvement. What that looks like is involvement. What that looks like is weekly involvement, making church and a church community a regular part of your life. That's called involvement. What that also looks like is getting involved in a life group. That's called involvement. What that also looks like is going through grow track. That's called involvement. What it also looks like is serving the worship team before you are on the worship team. That's called involvement. What that looks like is inviting a friend to church. That's called involvement in the building of the local church. And what I believe is that God has a unique amount of influence and a measure of influence for each and every one of you. But we will never have the influence we're supposed to have without the involvement that God wants us to give. It's going to require involvement, and he wants us involved. How do I know? Abraham was almost a hundred years old, and God had him having children. God really wants his people involved. I don't know if you know the science there, but that's like impossible. God really wanted this dude involved, because Abraham, at almost a hundred years old, he couldn't do it without God. He couldn't make this happen without God. 
He couldn't be the father of many nations without God. Abraham couldn't do it without God. But God wouldn't do it without Abraham. Because whenever God has a plan in place, he usually uses people to accomplish the purposes it's going to take to get that thing done. I believe God wants to use you. Therefore, he wants you involved. So how long am I supposed to serve? I don't know. That's between you and God. I think he just wants you to start. You'll know when you're supposed to stop if you're in tune with the voice of God. You got to get involved. My wife and I got involved in a life group last fall. It was awesome. Get involved. I encourage you. God wanted Abraham to be a part of this. And Abraham then took the upwards of 100,000 steps it would have taken for him and his servants and his son to get to Moriah. Almost 100,000 steps is what it probably took for him to get there. And it's interesting, in, in faith communities, the big steps of faith often get all the attention, but it's actually the small steps of faithfulness that get us where God's calling us to go. And some of you are so focused on this big step of faith you're, you think you're supposed to take. And take the small steps of faithfulness. Be consistent. Be a good friend. Be a good son. Be a good daughter. That's called faithfulness. He shows up to this region of Moriah, and look what he does. Abraham does what God asks. He climbs the mountain with his son. He does what God asks. He doesn't stop and reconsider. He doesn't stop and pray about it. He doesn't stop and ask God if he changed his mind. He doesn't stop and ask his servants and his friends if this is really a good idea. He doesn't stop to make the choice. Why? Because he had already made a decision. See, when you make a decision in Beersheba, you don't have to make a choice at Moriah. Some of you in this room... You desperately need to make a decision today so you don't have to make a choice six months from now. Some of you need to make a decision that you're going to be faithful with your giving right now so you don't have to make a choice when it comes November. Some of you need to make a decision that you're going to be pure in your relationship right now so you don't have to make a choice six months or a year from now. And some of my young men in the room... You need to make a decision that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord so that you don't have to make that choice when you're 25 and things are getting difficult. You're already going to know who you're following, where you're going, that his word is going to be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Do we have any decision makers in the room today saying, I'm ready to make a decision for Jesus? We got to make decisions so we don't have to make a choice. If you've made a decision to be pure, you know going into this situation, ladies, you're not gonna let this boy close because you know the deal. You don't have to make that choice because you already made the decision. Make the decision. Abraham made a decision long before he had to make that choice. Make the decision. Tell your parents about the decision. Tell your leadership about the decision. Whatever the decision is, make the decision. He made a decision. And so he took his son and they began to climb this mountain. And as they're climbing, they're going to the place of the sacrifice. We see one of the most heart-wrenching moments, I believe, in all of the Old Testament. Maybe in all of the Bible. Especially as a parent. Goodness, this wrecks me. For as they're walking to make the sacrifice, Isaac turns to his father and he says, Father, I see the wood, I've got it on my back, and the the fire, you've got the torch. But dad, where's the sacrifice? And here we see the son asking about the sacrifice, not knowing that he was the sacrifice. It's heart-wrenching. But then we see Abraham, I can just imagine, Possibly even biting his lip, trying not to get emotional, trying not to cry, his voice shaky. He says, son, the Lord's going to provide a sacrifice. The Lord's going to provide a sacrifice. The Lord's going to provide a sacrifice. See, Abraham, he knew what God said. God said you're to take your son and sacrifice him. But he also remembered what God had promised that there would be a lineage that would come from him and it was going to come through Isaac. He remembered what God promised. 
And even though Abraham could not have predicted what would happen on the top of that mountain, there is no way he could have predicted everything that took place, no way he could have predicted that God would provide in the way he would provide. But even though Abraham could not predict it, he professed it. Even though he couldn't predict what God would do, he professed that God was going to do something. Students, what would it sound like if a generation of students at James River Youth, even when they could not predict what God was going to do in their life, they started professing that God was going to do something in their life. Even when they couldn't predict how they were going to get out of the anxiety, they started professing that they were going to get out of the anxiety. And even when they couldn't predict how their family was going to get through this, they would profess that we are going to get through through it. I'll never forget riding in the car with my dad on the way to school, day after day, year after year. He always wanted to drive me to school. I could have taken the bus, but he wanted to drive me to school. And we'd sit out in front of the school, and sometimes I'd even be embarrassed, and I would kind of shrink down in my seat as my dad would put his hand on my knee and he would pray over me and he would say, Dear Heavenly Father, keep him safe. Give him wisdom. Help him to be a leader and help him to do the right thing. And sometimes when I was out late on the weekends, out much later than I should have been, my mom would lay awake praying for me. Oh God, I know you've got a plan for him. I know you've got a calling for his life. I know there's things that you want him to do and places that you want him to go. And what I realize now that I didn't even realize then is that the words they were saying and professing and praying, it wasn't even about my current posture. It was about my future potential. And even in this moment right now, I stand in the prayers and the words of my mom and dad. And if I need it, you need it. We've got to start professing the word of God in confidence that even when we can't predict what God's going to do, then we're professing that he's going to do something because that's who he is. That's who he is. Some of you need to start professing God's truth over your siblings, your younger siblings. Some of you older students in the room need to start professing the goodness of God over the students that you're sitting next to right now. The younger students are looking up to you. Give them something to look up at. Profess the word of God. You say, Pastor, that sounds kind of weird and I don't really know what to say. Read some scripture, pick the right scripture, the words of Jesus, and start professing that over their life. Profess the word of God over their life. Profess it. In this moment, it looked like it was going to be a very painful moment for Abraham and Isaac. And they go up this mountain and he, he puts him on the altar, gets the, the wood ready, puts his son there, he gets ready to slay his son. But he doesn't have to because God got his attention. God spoke to him, raised his attention. He noticed a ram, essentially a sheep caught in the thicket. He was able to sacrifice that ram in place of his son so his son didn't have to die. See, it looked like it was gonna be a very painful moment, but it, it actually turned out to be a prophetic moment. See, prophecy is when something is spoken or shown or predicted accurately years before it ever takes place. And this moment that looked like it would be full of pain was actually a prophetic moment. Because see, in the Old Testament, the son carried the wood up that mountain on his back. But in the New Testament, the son carried the wood on his shoulder. In the Old Testament, the son was laid on a wooden altar. But in the New Testament, the son was nailed to a wooden cross. And in the Old Testament, we see that there was a ram, essentially a sheep, that would end up taking the place of the Son. But in the New Testament, we see that the Son of God went to the cross and he took the place of all of the sheep. And we see that in the Old Testament, 
Isaac was led to a region that was known as Moriah. Well, in the New Testament, Jesus was led to a geographical location that actually set in the region that used to be called Moriah. And in the Old Testament, there was no human blood that had to be shed. Oh, but in the New Testament, the blood of Jesus was shed on the cross for you and for me. And guess what? The blood still works. It never goes out of style. It never gets old. It never goes bad. The blood of Jesus still works. It's the blood of Jesus. You can stay on your feet. You can stay on your feet. And some of you are going to respond to the voice of Jesus today because I'm here, because the leaders are here, because God's word is open and his Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Because here's what happened. Abraham has this moment with Isaac and God steps in, provides another sacrifice so Isaac doesn't have to die. The Bible says that Abraham, I want you to get this, that Abraham, after it had all happened, he actually calls God by a name that God had never been called by before. He calls him Jehovah Jireh. What that means is God the provider. God the one who will provide. And the Bible says he doesn't just call God the provider, he also renames the place where he was standing. He renames it on the mountain of the Lord. It will be provided. He literally renamed that place provision. Students, I believe that God's going to have you rename the season that you are currently in. I believe that God might have you rename the place where you are currently standing. Because just as it was for Abraham, it's not what it looks like. There is so much more going on than you could ever know. All that you see is not all that there is. And Abraham found that out, that it wasn't what it looked like. God is the provider, so this place is going to be called as such. See, in Scripture, people were often called by the places from which they came, but places were called according to what God did there. I'm believing in this season, God's going to do something great enough that you've got to give it a new name. I believe it. It's just not what it looks like. I believe the season that you are calling depressed, God might have you rename it peaceful and joyful. I believe the season that you're calling lonely, God might have you rename it as I know my God sticks closer than a brother. A season that you have labeled as complete chaos in your family, God might have you rename it as the moment where he calmed your soul and he calmed your mind and he calmed your household. You might say, this is the season where I was sick. I believe God might have you rename this season as the one where you were healed, where God did greater things than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Because that's what God does. When I was flying that plane at 8,000 feet in the air, even though I looked out the windows and it really felt like I was nosediving, it felt like everything was out of control. It was the strangest thing. All I would have had to do was take my eyes off of the windows and look at my instruments and they would have told me in the direction that I was going and they would have told me that I was climbing, not falling. In these next few moments, some of you are gonna need to take your eyes off the windows and check the gauges. You're gonna need to check what's in front of you, what God's trying to show you in this moment. And I think he will reveal to you that this season is not what it looks like. Even if that requires God to do a miracle at this altar in two minutes, I believe that he can do it. And I believe he's looking for a faith-filled generation to say, yes, we wanna go there. So right now, if you're in this room, If you know you need God's help to stop looking at the things on your left and on your right, and you know you wanna trust God with your life, you know you wanna trust him with some areas that you've never trusted him before, I'm not saying you don't know Jesus. That might be some of you, but not all of you. But I think there are a lot of us in the room who have areas that we've been holding on to so tightly that we're not giving to God. 
trying to figure it out on our own. I don't know what it is. It's between you and God. But I believe that at this altar, this is the moment where you give that to God and say, God, I'm believing. There's more happening than I can see. And I want you to take control. I want you to take control. If that's you in this place right now, don't wait. Come down to the altar. You know you need to respond. Come on, make a move to the altar. Come on. I believe there's more of you. We're not in a rush. I believe there's more of you. Come on, it's not what it looks like. For the student who's battling anxiety right now, it's, it's not what it looks like. I believe anxiety is real, but I also believe that the Holy Spirit can undo in a moment what the enemy has taken years to set up. It's not what it looks like. You're not too far gone. It's not what it looks like. Some of you are feeling hopeless. It's not what it looks like. It's not what it looks like because there is a hope in Jesus. And right now, if you're in your seat, I'm gonna have you do something that I think is, is oftentimes helpful. I need this sometimes. Turn to the person on your left and on your right and say, hey, if you wanna go down to the front and pray, I'll go with you. No one should have to come alone. Say, hey, you wanna go down to the front and pray, I will gladly go with you. We are in this thing together. That's awesome. More people are coming. We need the context of community sometimes. Make room. You can push all the way up to the front. We got to make room. More people are coming. More people are coming. Got to make room. We got to make room. It's great. It's great. It's great. Come on. You're being filled with hope this morning. You're being filled with faith this morning. There's so much more going on. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You can keep walking if you're walking. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you're in this place and your life, it's not being lived in relationship with Jesus. Maybe the first decision you need to make right now is that you need to follow Jesus. Maybe you were here last night and you felt like something was happening in your heart, but you didn't respond, or maybe you didn't feel anything last night, but you know the Holy Spirit spoke to you today. But if you're in this place, and you wanna make a decision to follow Jesus, either for the first time or the first time in a long time, every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you, on the count of three, I want you to put your hand up and keep it up for just a moment. One, two, three. Put your hand up all over this place. Awesome, 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 awesome. Awesome, 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 awesome. Anybody else? Come on, you know you need to accept Jesus into your heart. Awesome, I see it in the front. You can put your hand down. Awesome, awesome. Anybody else? That's great. Well, we're going to pray a prayer together. For those of you who are accepting Jesus into your heart, we're going to pray a prayer together. And then in just a moment, I believe God's going to do something in all of your hearts. Let's pray this together. Surround our brothers and sisters who are making this decision because it's the biggest decision and the best decision of their life. Dear Jesus, come on, repeat after me together. Dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins, change my heart, change my mind, change my direction. I want to be a follower of you all the days of my life. And Jesus, help me to be who you've called me to be. Help me to go where you've called me to go and help me to say, what you've called me to say in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Can we celebrate the dozens who just gave their heart to Jesus? Come on, they made the best decision of their life. And I'm gonna invite you right now to begin to lift your hands.